The death of China's most prominent dissident, cancer killed Liu Xiaobo, but many hold the Chinese government responsible. What does his loss mean for China's democracy movement? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. He was banned from making speeches, barred from publishing his writings, locked up and left to die in state custody. Liu Xiaobo, China's most prominent dissident and only Nobel Peace Prize winner, has been cremated in a private ceremony. He died on Thursday suffering from liver cancer while serving an 11-year prison sentence because of his calls for peaceful democratic reforms. Tributes have been pouring in worldwide, but there's little mention of him in his own country. And their concerns for his wife. Lu Xiao was allowed to attend her husband's funeral, but she is unwell after being under house arrest since he became a Nobel laureate seven years ago. He's the first to die in state custody since 1938. Lawrence Louis reports from Beijing. A private, low key funeral ceremony for China's Nobel laureate. Liu Xiaobo's body was cremated on Saturday and his ashes scattered into the sea. The only photos of the funeral are these handed out by the Chinese government. And contrary to an official statement, Liu's friends were not at the funeral. We spoke to one of them, Hu Jia, who is under house arrest. Am I speaking to Hu Jia? These people in the photos released by the government are not friends with Liu Xiaobo and his wife. Some of them are plainclothes officers from Beijing. They are from the police station that monitors Liu Xia's neighborhood. I know them. Several hours later, one of Liu's older brothers appeared at a press conference organized by the local government. He chose his words carefully, thanking the government for the medical care given to Liu Xiaobo. His widow didn't speak to reporters. Miss Liu Xia is not able to come over in person due to her very weak condition, and she may receive hospital treatment as she is in great sorrow. It is a pity, but she has entrusted me to forward her thanks. She's said to be suffering from depression after nearly seven years of house arrest. In all that time, she's never been charged with a crime. There was no word from the family on whether she's been freed, despite claims from a local government official at a separate conference for the media. Miss Lu Xia is a Chinese citizen. China's relevant departments will protect her legal rights according to law. According to my understanding, Lu Xia is currently free. Even after his death, the government appears to be intent on stage managing Liu Xiaobo's funeral arrangements. With his ashes scattered into the sea, the leadership has been able to avoid the possibility of a shrine being built that would have been a lasting memorial to China's Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Florence Louis, Al Jazeera, Beijing. Liu Xiaobo was a poet, academic, intellectual, and one of the fiercest critics of the Chinese Communist Party. He was credited with saving lives by negotiating the safe exit of hundreds of demonstrators during the Tiananmen Square pro-democracy protests of 1989. He was jailed several times for speaking out against China's leaders. He co-authored a pro-democracy manifesto known as Charter 08 in 2008. The following year, he was sentenced to 11 years in prison for what prosecutors called inciting subversion of state power. In 2010, he became the only Chinese to win the Nobel Peace Prize, Organizers praised his long and nonviolent struggle for fundamental human rights in China. Liu was in jail at the time and was represented at that ceremony by an empty chair. Let's take a look at the manifesto that landed Liu in jail. Charter 08, as it's called, is a petition calling for fundamental political reforms in China with greater human rights and democratic freedoms for its people. It was signed by more than 300 Chinese dissidents and intellectuals, as well as 2,000 other citizens. Among other things, it calls for the reaffirmation of the principles of democracy, freedom, human rights, and equality. It pushes for the Constitution to be amended where people have the ultimate political power with equal voting rights for all. And it urges direct elections for all legislative bodies and public offices, as well as an independent judiciary and separation of power. Let's bring in our guest. Joining us from Beijing is Einar Tang, an international politics and economics commentator. 
From Nottingham is Andres Fulda, assistant professor at the University of Nottingham. And from Hong Kong via Skype is William Nee, researcher at Amnesty International. First, though, before we get to the panel, joining us is Barrett Rees Anderson, head of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, who joins us on the line from Marvik in Norway. And we appreciate your time very much. You believe that China bears responsibility for Liu Xiaobo's death. How? Well, um, I suspect they have a responsibility because the fact is that Liu Xiaobo was terminally ill before he was transferred from prison to medical care. And this indicates that he has not received proper medical care prior to his hospitalization. Do you think that there was enough outcry from the international community that maybe, possibly, could have affected um, him being able to get access to better treatment? Well, uh, the outside community was not really aware of Liu Chaobo's condition before it was announced that he had been hospitalized because he has been kept in strict isolation throughout his imprisonment. And representatives of the Norwegian Nobel Committee have not been able to get in touch with him. And when he was hospitalized, um, the worldwide reaction was actually rather cautious and downplayed because uh, China has a tendency to re react very unfavorably to states who uh, criticize their human rights situation. Um, and we actually are going to address that that exact topic very shortly with the panel. But first, I want to I want to ask you: How do you? What do you know, rather, about how his wife is? We have heard um, nothing about his wife's situation. I have I have also seen uh, the reports in international papers today that there was in fact a, a ceremony, and it was uh, Chinese officials who have sent out photographs from a funeral ceremony. As you perhaps are aware of, I approached the um, Chinese embassy yesterday uh, to apply for a visa to possibly attend his funeral, but they refused to receive my visa application. Okay, Barrett Rees Anderson, head of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. Thank you very much for joining us on the line from Norway. We appreciate it. And let's turn to our panel now to pick up the discussion from there. Einar, I want to go to you first. Uh, I assume you're able to hear what uh, Barrett Reese Anderson was saying about the fact that the the world didn't know until perhaps it was too late the condition that Lu Xiaobo um, Lu Xiaobo was in. Why why would that be? Well, as she said, he was kept in isolation. But I, I think, as she admitted, most of her ideas about this are speculation. She doesn't know. I mean, in many of the instances here, I mean, you have to remember, if the Chinese government wanted to keep this quiet, they could have kept him in isolation, say they treated him. When he died, they could have announced that he passed away from whatever causes and did it. I think the Chinese government feels uh, a little put out that they thought they were doing, quote, the right thing by getting him medical treatment, and then were being castigated and having this incident used as a bludgeon against them. Okay. Um... William, would, would you agree with that um, assessment that China in some way would be able to say that, that the death of Liu Xiaobo and the reaction to it is somehow being used against them, used as a bludgeon, as Einar said? I would not categorize this as being used as a bludgeon. Um, I think that, first of all, Liu Xiaobo was in prison for inciting subversion uh, for 11 years. And that's a charge that does not meet international laws and standards. Um, now... For the last month of his life, um, he, of course, now as the German and, and U.S. doctors have testified, did to, seem to be receiving decent care. Um, but it, he may have been able to receive better care if he had gone abroad. And what we saw, really, is the Chinese government trying to control Liu Xiaobo for over 25 years, and no more so than in the last month of his life. And even after he died today, we saw you know, plainclothes officers who had who were attending his funeral and massive um, amounts of control, including at the press conference that his brothers put on. So they really were trying to control this process um, and control Leo Sabo, most likely because they didn't want to risk him going abroad and 
letting the power of his voice and the power of his ideas take hold. Andres, what do you know about how, what the reaction was to Lu Xiaobo's death on the limited social media and internet that is in China and how it may or may not have been controlled and manipulated? What do you know? Okay, first of all, of course, such news are very tightly controlled, as one would expect. I think, um, you know, I would like to briefly comment on uh, my uh, other panelists' uh, assessment of, you know, how this was uh, very carefully stage managed. I think we need to be mindful that, of course, uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago in North Korea, um, uh, an American uh, student actually uh, almost died in custody, uh, custody and was then um, uh, sent back to uh, the United States and uh, passed away shortly thereafter. And what's very interesting is that uh, when uh, um, uh, Vambia, this uh, American student, died, a lot of Chinese netizens were um, very upset about that and they were very critical of the North Korean leadership. And this is certainly something that will have been uh, noticed in mainland China uh, by members of the uh, security apparatus uh, where they became aware that uh, they, they tried to probably uh, avoid a situation uh, where one would have uh, you know, made a link uh, between the treatment of, of uh, Vombia in uh, North Korea and the treatment of Liu Xiaobo in China. Einar, how would you characterize their reaction to Liu Xiaobo's death in China? And I realize that's a very broad question with so many people, so I realize I'm asking you to, to paint with the broad brush, but, but, but break it down how, how you choose to. How is he being remembered? Well, you, you have to split up Lu Xiaobo into two parts. There was the intellectual uh, and things like that. And the other part of it was him as a, as a dissident, as doing it. In China, there's a very bright line between discussions between people and then advocacy of change. And he, in the Chinese government's mind, uh, they clearly thought he had crossed that line. That's what he was convicted of. It's kind of like Snowden for you know, many Americans. They feel that he is a hero. But if he were to turn to the United States, he almost certainly would face incarceration. So you always have these conflicts within. The question is, is this uh, something internal to China or is this something where the world is standing as the court and the executioner in terms of doing this? From the Chinese perspective, yes, they are managing this because they're concerned that this will be used as it is being used as a kind of way of downplay, uh, saying that China does not obey the rules, does not respect human rights. But Einar, the Einar, are they, you know, are they also, back, Einar, uh, many just a years, the are they years also, of humiliation. Are they mm -hmm. also trying to sure. control, I understand what you're, I hear what you're saying. You're saying that, that they want to make sure that this isn't some way uh, manipulated to, to, as you use the word, bludgeon China, but are they also managing it so that they can manage what, what, Chinese people actually think about him, what his, how his death resonates with them. Is that the other reason, perhaps, that they are managing it? Oh, absolutely, undoubtedly, that they, they do not want this to become a symbol. Now, quite frankly, I mean, since 2008, since uh, a, lot of, a lot of changes have happened, we've moved from a monopolar to a multipolar world, and the, the perceptions of the world around are very important to China, especially as it's going out on its Belt and Road Initiative. So internally and externally, yes, the government puts a high premium on managing the affairs of the country. Now, within China, there has been very little reaction because there's been very little press coverage of it. To the extent that there has been, there's been shown concern for the wife. Uh, there's been uh, saying that give her time to grieve and things like that. These are the public pronouncements. But behind it, yes, China, the Chinese government is trying to prevent this from becoming another episode where they feel that they are being demonized for what they believe is their right in terms of handling the internal affairs of their country. William, what are your concerns for Liu Xiaobo's widow now? Well, uh, we are very concerned about Liu, Xia, Liu Xiaobo's widow, Liu Xia. Um, as you know, she spent seven years under uh, de facto house arrest while Liu Xiaobo was imprisoned, um, you know, getting harassed, uh, not allowing her to contact the outside world very much. Um, and through this, she developed depression. So Liu Xiaobo apparently uh, decided that he wanted to go abroad in the last month, partly because he wanted a better situation for his wife once he passed. So Amnesty International right now actually has a petition urging people to sign to try to get Liu Xia abroad. I know it's everybody's right to travel freely. She's never committed a crime, so you know there's no reason to stop her from doing this. 
And also, we, we encourage the international community to speak up now to, uh, to urge the Chinese authorities to let Liu Xia travel abroad if, if she so wishes. Um, Andres, former past, pres past presidents, pardon me, past U.S. presidents um, made statements about the impact of Liu Xiaobo and his memory and his legacy. But current president um, Donald Trump actually just hours after Liu Xiaobo passed away actually praised Xi Jinping. All right. This is what he said, describing Xi Jinping. He said, he's a friend of mine. I have great respect for him. We've gotten to know each other very well. He's a great leader, very talented man. Um, he loves China. He wants to do what's right for China. And then a, a little while later, the White House did release an official statement about the passing of Liu Xiaobo. But where I'm going with this is this dance between the West and China that goes back and forth. It, it changes. But it seems, it seems consistently, one thing that is consistent is Western governments are often timid about confronting China on human rights. Why? Well, you see, um, one of the panelists uh, just mentioned that we've uh, moved into this multipolar world, but uh, uh, equally, equally one could say that um, we're not living in, um, in an age of reformation but restoration, and um, the rise of illiberalism uh, is very evident uh, to all of us. And therefore, to expect a, a kind of imaginary monolithic West uh, to stand up to China I think that is a kind of slightly dated perspective. Certainly, personally, I feel that more could be done. Um, but uh, to expect, for example, the, American, the current American president uh, to do much about the human rights situation in China is, um, is um, not necessarily um, a realistic expectation. Uh, so I think uh, for us in Europe, I think we, we have to maybe start afresh on how we can actually engage with China on human rights in a, in a more critical way, in a more creative way. Um, because my concern is that um, uh, after the death of Liu Xiaobo, in the public perception, um, it, we may get to a situation where people say, well, it's game over. Um, China is uh, it's a hopeless case. There's nothing that can be done. And I think if that was, uh, uh, let's say, the consequence of his uh, uh, premature uh, demise and, and death, um, then I think that would be a real tragedy. Um, what I think we should be doing is, yes, we should be outraged and extremely critical about what happened to both Liu Xiaobo and his wife, and by the way, also his brother-in-law, who uh, is still in jail for probably uh, trumped up uh, charges. But at the same time, we should not uh, forget that Chinese society is changing. There are many extremely intelligent, capable people. For example, the public intellectual Xu Zhiyong has just been released from jail. Um, there are other very interesting, what I call trans-establishment reformers, like uh, Yu Jianrong. And all of these people have a very um, strong interest in seeing China become more open, more liberal. And I, I do think that um, we still need to uh, have a, you know, a conversation with these kind of people and, uh, you know, to give China the chance to, to open up and liberalize in the long run. Einar, is, is China even, I don't know if susceptible is the word I'm looking for, susceptible to, to, out, to outside pressure at all? I mean, is their, is their human rights record really tied to their economic future? Well, in, in terms of whether China is susceptible to outside uh, things, yes, they are. And that's why they're acting the way they are, in part, over this incident. They do not want uh, symbols being used against them. Uh, in terms of human rights, they're very prickly on this. The whole idea that there is some ultimate world order that defines everything in terms of, you know, American exceptionalism or liberal democratic capitalism is not something that China actually believes. They think that they are on their own path. I think they've cho uh, shown that they've had success in that. And they believe in many instances that the West is trying to derail that, whether it's by encircling it with, uh, on the seas or picking fights on trade issues and things like that. So that's their perception of this, that the West does not wish them well, and that often that these um, political uh, issues that come up are just conveniences for trying to keep China in check. Um, William, China's growth rate has slowed considerably, the slowest that it's been in quite some time, right? If something like that were to level off, do you think, do you see 
economic pressure as an opening to have any impact on human rights, or is that less and less a connection? Well, I think that these days, uh, foreign governments are relatively reluctant to use economic pressure as a way to ch challenge China. Um, you know, since the 1989 Tiananmen crackdown, the economy has grown roughly 40 times. Um, and now with One Belt, One Road, they're actually uh, directing money elsewhere in the developing world. So I think that's probably not realistic. But, you know, I think the, when we're talking about the global order and human rights, I mean, we're talking about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, things that have been agreed upon by the international community that China is not uh, respecting. You know, they're not respecting freedom of expression um, in terms of publishing or the internet. And they're actually increasing these controls on things like VPNs and trying to increase this idea of cyber sovereignty. Um, so I think there's a great uh, danger if people just think, well, China's human rights issues are for China only, when they're trying to very aggressively promote the ideas of cyber, so cyber sovereignty um, and, and the, the model of the Great Firewall, in addition to the way that they're clamping down on NGOs, and that this is also attractive to other countries. So what happens in China and the way it, it, it governs itself will ultimately have ramifications for the whole world, which I think is one added reason why we all should care. Okay, and, and to that point, Andres, if I recall a few minutes ago, you were the one that said that you were somewhat optimistic, at least slightly optimistic about some of the things that you see happening in China, such as what? On the one hand, of course, I'm also uh, very mindful of all these uh, things that just have been mentioned, uh, the very um, uh, draconian uh, overseas NGO law, for example, and uh, various other initiatives uh, aimed at uh, clamping down on uh, uh, freedom of speech, for example, at uh, Chinese universities. Um, but, you know, I'm somewhat optimistic. You see, Liu Xiaobo once wrote an essay, uh, and he developed the idea uh, that uh, the Chinese political system would necessarily have to evolve if Chinese society is evolving and changing. Um, the way uh, Liu Xiaobo put it, he said, uh, to change the system by changing society. Now, I don't think that any one actor can change China society, but it is already changing. I mean, think of the periphery, um, you know, um, clearly, well, uh, Hong Kong, for example, is a, is a good example. Tibet, uh, the problems uh, that they have in terms of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, um, uh, Xinjiang with, uh, you know, the conflicts with Uyghurs, uh, also many conflicts that exist, of course, within China in terms of the, the rise of Christianity, etc. And... Um, in a way, um, the political winter in China that we're seeing right now and these very draconian laws, they're in, to, to a certain extent, they're a reaction towards a changing Chinese society. And uh, the people I've met over the past 10 years, there are lots of people with you know, liberal ideas and you know, people who actually want the rule of law, for example. And um, clearly that is a challenge for the Chinese Communist Party, which doesn't want to have any of it. Um, but I'm really doubtful whether one can really keep the societal changes in check. Um, and that's why I, I think um, to give up hope on uh, uh, Chinese society, uh, uh, its ability uh, to eventually liberalize and democratize, I think would be um, you know, a, a bad idea, uh, actually a self-fulfilling prophecy, so to speak. Okay, and that will be our final word. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the discussion. Appreciate it. Thank you to Einar Tangen, Andreas Folda, and William Mee. Thank you all, and thank you as well for watching. You can see the program anytime again if you go to our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now.